Hello, everybody. As a, I'm David Bulkins. I'm the director of the program on the legal profession, and this is our almost every weekly uh, week series uh, in which we bring really interesting people to come talk to the Harvard Law School community about innovative things that are going on in the legal profession. Uh, usually, at this point, I introduce the speakers, but instead I'm going to introduce someone even more important than the speakers, and this is our colleague, Guhan Subramanian, who does a variety of fascinating things here at Harvard Law School and Harvard Business School in teaching, uh, including teaching courses that really, I think, exemplify the interaction between theory and practice by looking at deals, bringing all the participants together. He does a number of uh, terrific things around the areas of uh, negotiation and mergers and a whole range of things. And we're delighted that he's here, and he's going to introduce our speaker. So, good. <clears throat> Thank you, David. I'm going to be very brief in order to save as much time as we can for our presenters. Uh, and I'll say at the outset that I'm here as part of PLP, but also in a quasi-personal capacity. Uh, because, full disclosure, uh, Marlene, our uh, co-presenter, and I went to high school together. Oh and uh, I've been aware of her career uh, ever since then, including Potomac Law Group. And it's just a great pleasure to have her here uh, to present with her partner in this very exciting enterprise. Um, just as one little uh, story, uh, which I can't even tell to myself very well, but I was traveling with a classmate of mine, a roommate of mine, through Eastern Europe, Poland and so on, and Marlene and her sister were living in Moscow, and we had the great idea of taking a train from Krakow to Moscow, which is about 15 hours, and then visiting with her and her sister back in the late 80s. So this was uh, end of the Cold War. We got stopped in the middle of the night. We were taken off the train by Polish uh, military officers with machine guns. Uh, we were then put back on the train. Everything was fine. They had to change rails back in those days because the, the anyway. We got to Moscow. There were no internet, no cell phones, obviously. We figured out how to get to her place. It was the rattiest apartment I think I've ever seen. And I slept on this painful, um, lazy boy recliner. My roommate from high school slept on the couch. It was painful, but it was very gracious of her to host. And this is, in some ways, payback. <laughs> oh, so we're going to be painful <laughs> security guards. Thanks. So uh, uh, Marlene and Ben are here to present about the Potomac Law Group. Uh, ben Lieber is the, um, get the title right, uh, uh, managing partner. Marlene is the chief operating partner. They both have extensive experience in both business and law. And I think one of the things we'll talk about is the exciting interplay of those two things. I'll say one last thing by way of introduction. Um, in the business school arena, there's a lot of talk about disruptive innovation. And to me, this feels like disruptive innovation. Big law is not going to go away. There's always going to be a role for big law. But this will, and I think is inevitable, going to fill a niche, a very important niche in the legal profession. So it's really great to see Marlene and Ben, and thank you for coming to campus to talk about what you do at Potomac. And while they walk up, I'll just put in a plug that either on March 6th or 7th, we haven't quite nailed down the date, we're going to have a conference here at Harvard Law School on disruptive innovation in the law, in which the guru of disruptive innovation, Clay Christensen, is going to be one of our keynote speakers. And we're going to invite as many smart people like Marlene and Ben as we can to come talk about what they do. Mm. Great, great. Well, thank you very much, David and Guhan, for that warm and colorful introduction. <laughs> And also for the opportunity to be here today with you to discuss these exciting developments in the legal profession um, that have really created a lot of opportunity and options uh, for entrepreneurial attorneys. Um, so before we get to the exciting new opportunities that have been created in recent times, we thought it would be helpful to go back and really tell the story, um, identify the trends and the forces that were at work that created the conditions uh, that made it right for us to enter the market. Um, so we'll go back a few decades to what has been called the golden years in big law. Um, you see here, and basically what developed over throughout the golden years period is a pyramid structure in big law that um, involved few equity partners at top 
and a lot of associates at the bottom. And then gradually, as you near the top, the narrowing of the ranks. Um, it also relied a lot on the attraction and the training of really well-credentialed and educated um, attorneys. So from the top law schools, these associates were recruited and hopefully uh, trained and retained. Um, and then basically, as I mentioned, the creation of this tournament type atmosphere. So as the attorneys, the associates moved along in their career and the pyramid narrowed as you reach the top, you see that um, basically associates and counsel are competing for these very few slots at the top of the equity chain. Um, and the system really, the big law model, um, relied a lot on the apprenticeship system, the idea that you get training from more senior attorneys and um, had a partnership structure. And then at the very core of the big law model was really the high billable rate, which continued, as we'll show in a few slides, um, to increase over the years, even throughout the economic recession. Um, but this really is a core of the big law model, is the structure and the way that they built, which is generally by a high billable rate. So throughout the golden years, you'll see this tremendous growth over a 25-year period um, from 1986 to 2008, right before the economic downturn. You'll see the attorney headcount increased 228%. Uh, and then even more remarkable is the incredible increase in gross revenues realized. And these are by big law firms, so basically the AMLA 100 law firms you see here. Um, so this is all part of the story of the golden years, basically increasing the number of highly qualified credential attorneys, the headcount goes up, and correspondingly the gross revenue that these uh, firms earn also goes up. And here you see um, that the profits enjoyed by the partners at the top of the pyramid grows up exponentially, really doubling in real terms. And you'll see at the top is that the blue shows the number of the profits per partner, but then the red is the inflation. So you'll see how the profit is really going up exponentially. And that's 1260 in 2008. For some reason, on this computer, it's not coming up. It's, it's, it didn't drop precipitously. That's, uh, that's 1.26 million. That's the okay. doubling. That's yeah. yeah, even in that year, um, it continued to go up, which was a tentative year. Um, so this is where the, the story begins to change a little bit. So you see the, this time period leading up to the, the golden years that big law is really enjoying a boom time. Uh, law firms are doing great uh, in realizing tremendous profits, um, particularly the partners, but also the associates are uh, experiencing increase in salaries, as we'll show in a minute as well. Um, but at the same time, this system isn't working for everyone necessarily. And you start to see growing the seeds of discontent um, among clients and then later attorneys as well. Um, so what you see during this time period, even before 2008, um, the Great Recession, you see that outside counsel begins to resist uh, the way that big law is doing business. Um, so after years of steady rate, increases, you see that um, there's really a need for growing legal services with increased government regulation, you have a greater litigiousness generally, the globalization, a trend towards papering deals more. Um, but at the same time, the clients decide um, in basically reaction, in response to these high rates, to start moving more of their work in-house um, because it's basically more cost efficient for them to hire someone in-house full-time than to retain a big law attorney. Um, and you also see that they start, the clients start to push back on the way big law is doing business. So in a recent survey actually of uh, legal officers um, in corporations, 47% of the CLOs said that they're decreasing outside counsel legal budget. So this started already the seeds even before and has continued to this day, really a constricting of outside legal spend budget. Um, 
Also, there's some frustration with a perceived lack of efficiency in big law firms. So you see a, a study that was done starting in 2008 up through this current year. Basically, uh, these in-house chief legal officers gave big law a medium score of 3 out of 10, with 10 being the highest in terms of their efficiency and whether or not these outside uh, legal counsel, the big law firms, are responding to their needs for um, different types of services. So I'm basically... Sorry, I'm sorry, can, I, can you just repeat what you just said? It's 3 out of 10 from yes, the clients? Yes. So for five years in a row, the clients, the chief legal officers of these major corporations gave law firms a 3 out of 10 for their perceived um, efficiency or lack thereof of the big law firms. Um, so while this is going on and the clients are becoming increasingly dissatisfied, big law responds by increasing their rates. And remarkably. Um, even in those difficult years, 2009 to 2011, you see that big law um, increased their rates. The top 25% of big law firms increased their rates 18% from 2009 to 2011, so that the average associate billable hourly rate became $600 an hour. So you see associate rates raising amid uh, even faster than key measures of inflation during the economic downturn. And GCs now basically see big law as becoming less responsive. Um, there was a recent survey that came out um, that showed, it was actually cited in the Harvard Business Review last month that said among GCs, 57% said that big law attorneys are actually less responsive than other law firm counsel. Um, less responsive. Responsiveness is basically a key to providing client service. Um, so that's sort of a remarkable statistic. And also, I think in view of all these pressures um, that I just laid out, 74% of these GCs said that they would consider uh, a, big, a lawyer other than outside of big law um, if they could offer a discount of 30% or greater. So that's really lays the conditions for where we enter the picture, um, which we'll, we'll get to in a minute. But before we do that, this basically explains laying the conditions for how we enter the picture, the client's dissatisfied with big law. So now we'll discuss where we get our talent pool from, which is essentially the associates and the attorneys at the same time beginning to experience increasing dissatisfaction with life and big law firm. So they saw a great jump in the number of minimum annual billable hour requ requirements. So in a 1958 ABA pamphlet, it was suggested that attorneys aspire to bill 1,300 hours a year. So now the minimum requirement in most big law firms is 1,900 to 2,100 hours a year billable, which is much different than actual work. Uh, so you can see over time the emphasis of the billable rate and using the hour as the metric. Um, pressures have really increased. At the same time, Attorneys, the partners who have come before are sort of pulling up the ladder and making it more difficult for associates and counsel to achieve partnership by lengthening the partnership track. And also, um, we saw a big introduction of the two-tier partnership. So it used to be just you made partner, you were equity partner, you made it. But then starting in 94, 44 um, of the big law firms had a two-tier partnership. And then 10 years later, it was 77 of the 100 big law. And now, uh, I think nearly all of them have two-tier partnership, which first tier means that your partner, basically in name only, uh, you see most of your compensation by fixed salary. And then the second tier is when you're an equity partner, which is when you truly um, benefit from the profits of the partnership. Um, and at the same time, all these additional work hours, you see that the big law firms really have rigid work schedules. So no few opportunities, if any, for part-time schedules. Um, if at most, they were tolerated, certainly not supported. Um, maybe if someone went off on a maternity leave, they came back part-time for a while, but it was with the understanding that within a year or two, they would have to resume full-time um, at the same workload. And also, very few, if any, opportunities for telecommunication. Um, so very inflexible in terms of uh, the work arrangements for attorneys. And you saw a lot of uh, lateral behavior, so moving, um, attorneys leaving firms, looking for greener pastures, and so it basically uh, resulted in less 
collaborative um, behavior among attorneys and more attorneys seeing that their golden ticket for making a lateral move was really having a book of business, which meant creating client silos, which uh, gave less opportunity for attorneys to work um, collaboratively. Okay, so um, at the same time that this is all going on, um, big law firms themselves um, have become further entrenched in their fixed costs. Um, so what you see is that uh, first year associate salary from 1996 to 2008 increased from 88% increase and other uh, legal jobs outside of big law um, increased about 40% during the same time period. Um, just anecdotally a personal story. I came out of law school in 98, started my first job at a big law firm, and um, within a week I was notified that I had received a $10,000 um, increase in my salary, um, simply because in that same week Skadden had increased their starting salary by 10000 so all of the firms were responding to this in competition, and so um, that's just how things went at that time period. Of course, things have changed since then and plateaued, <laughs> Um, but you know those those were the good old days, and this is basically how firms got into this problem of fixed cost, high associate salaries. Um, as we'll also show, they, they entered into long-term leases um, of pricey office space. Um, they had to maintain these expensive IT systems. They have artwork, um, the fancy offices, the great views, and uh, also have went into foreign expansion in a bigger way that increased their costs. Um, so here we see in the, the second part of the presentation is that the tide started to turn. So in, in response to all of those conditions that were set up um, that I just described, now we see here um, things changed. Basically what had started to be seeds of discontentment among clients and attorneys now in 2008 hits, we see for the first time just in record numbers layoffs. 76 out of the 100 um, AMLA firms start laying off associates and then also partners, even de-equitizing partners, um, and really in record numbers here. Um, and then you see some notable bankruptcies, dissolutions, which happen in historic numbers to really historic law firms that had been around for over 100 years, um, really started to falter because of these conditions that they had created. Um, you know, each firm has its own story as to why it failed, but the general trend is some of them were not able to integrate post-merger, um, the trouble, the cultures of the two different firms. And then also there was this trend of luring over lateral partners with books of businesses and promising them large amounts of money for an uh, extended number of years. And uh, that was the undoing of uh, a number of these firms up here. Um, so then that brings us to the next part of our presentation, um, where how all of those conditions really created this opportunity. Um, the big law firms faltering, the clients becoming dissatisfied um, with not only the high price, but the quality of the service, and then the attorneys themselves, who are incredibly credentialed and well-trained, um, seeking alternatives to the big law lifestyle. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. So from this turbulent time uh, came the rise of the new model firms, of which we are one. Um, there were a number of dimensions upon which the uh, new firms improved on the old ones. Um, as Marlene mentioned, a lot of the big firms have locked in expensive infrastructure. They've made decisions that were going to come back to haunt them for some time. They've limited their ability to be nimble, to respond to changes in the marketplace. But firms that were created from scratch uh, didn't suffer from the same legacy issues, legacy IT and uh, major investments in long-term leases and so forth. Um, and so they were free to design from the, the ground up. Um, in particular, office space, uh, as Marley mentioned, many of these big firms even today have uh, more space than they need. Uh, they may have every office filled, a uh, few of them do, but even in that case, you'll see uh, what used to be <coughs> Uh, executive or secretarial or executive assistant space, common space in front of all of the um, offices. When I started out in 95, uh, there was one secretary for each attorney, and so there was one full set of space in front of each office, and, and these days it's, it's four to one or five to one, and so you have quite a bit of excess capacity. 
Um, a lot of new model firms are moving to a more of a virtual environment where there's office space where people can come and meet and they can uh, work, but more often they're working from home or they're working from other locations. Uh, billing, uh, big firms uh, very much are still by the billable hour. There's talk of, uh, quite a bit of talk about alternative fee arrangements, but in practice, um, those, those aren't, uh, they haven't caught in, they haven't uh, been adopted in, in, to the extent that the clients would like. Uh, whereas on the, uh, with, a, with a new firm, a new model firm, it's easy to, to put in place all sorts of new billing arrangements. Uh, technology especially, uh, when, when we started out, we looked at, um, uh, for example, uh, time entry systems, time uh, voicing systems for our firm. At a, at a, you talk to a big company that does it for big law firms, it's $1,000 per seat per year. Uh, and when, a, when an attorney is billing about a million dollars worth of fees every year, $1,000 is just a drop in the bucket. But uh, you get into a virtual firm environment where you're charging less, um, and uh, a crop of uh, vendors have, crop have uh, arisen where you can, we're paying $10 a month per lawyer uh, for a license to use that kind of technology. It's all in the cloud, we don't have servers. Uh, and that, that allows uh, much more maneuvering on fees. Uh, uh, technology, uh, I talked about lifestyle is another big piece. Um, when I started in 95, this is probably not a surprise to anybody, but uh, we used to have, especially women, would, would leave after the seventh or eighth year uh, of being an associate. They'd have kids, they'd try to come back after six months on a part-time schedule, and invariably it wouldn't work out. They would either quit or they would go full-time. Um, and so as a result, most of them will quit. Uh, you have a lot of very high legal capacity that's idle, uh, that the big firms can't accommodate that kind of profile, and so it's inefficient. Well, the new firms can accommodate that, and, um, and there's a lot that can be done with that. Um, here's, a, here's a look a little bit at the landscape. Um, we've segmented it on top by the complexity of work and then along the, the side on, on um, the, the, uh, the segment and, and effect of uh, company. So uh, the first uh, at, up top of new model law firms, these are true law firms. Uh, uh, Ramon was here last month speaking. Um, they have an interesting model where they'll, they'll recruit partners from big firms and put them in a low overhead environment, um, allowing them to charge lower rates and also keep a higher proportion of what they build. Uh, and so it's, that's been a very successful approach for them. Um, Clearspire is another one. Are people generally familiar with the, are these familiar names, or are these not so much? Um, Clearspire is another one that's a couple years old. They, they spent, it's a virtual firm, they spent $5 million building a proprietary platform that allows uh, attorneys to communicate from uh, home offices. They, uh, they, they can instant message, they can share files, and so forth. Um, and, it's, uh, and again, they come in at a lower rate. Um, BLP Virtual Law Partners is a little bit of a twist on that. Um, it's more of a, a shared marketing umbrella, I would say, for lawyers. Uh, it, it maybe they're sole, sole practitioners, they come together. Um, their synergies and coming together, they can share marketing expenses and so forth. But, and then there's us, which I'll come to. But um, these are just examples. There are many others. Uh, it seems like every month there's somebody new. Um, but those are, those are in the traditional uh, the, the main difference between the new model law firms and the old model law firms is, is cost. We're, we're all coming in at half the rate or, or less. Um, then you have high-end legal staffing. Axiom is, a, is a, the dominant example there, I would say. Uh, Axiom has taken advantage of the, the trend toward high, uh, more work being captured by companies in-house. Uh, so and to save money, Marley mentioned that, that you see the the rise of in-house departments. It used to be that in-house was not a very, not a, a, a very high-profile job. Lawyers would not really want to go in-house, uh, but that's changed over time. In-house departments are getting bigger and bigger. As they've gotten larger, uh, you'll start to see uh, voids, uh, discontinuities. People go out on attorney leave or people quit, and so Axiom is, provides lawyers to fill in. They, they loan lawyers to big companies for periods of time, six months or a year, what have you. Um, and as those, as the size of legal departments has risen, uh, so has Axiom. Uh, there are a variety of other ones, high legal staff. And then at the, at the lowest level, uh, document review, due diligence for corporate deals, uh, there are a lot of technology plays taking place down there here on NGO3. Uh, again, the use of technology to 
to take away from big firms what they used to do. They, big firms used to have armies of associates that would handle that, and now it's all outsourced. So PLG, uh, I mentioned we started uh, in 2011 with 10 attorneys. Most of those attorneys originally were the, the, the profile I mentioned with the, they were stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home dad who had a brilliant legal career. They'd gone to top schools, worked at top firms. They wanted to work a flexible schedule. The big firms couldn't accommodate that. Um, and so we started with that. Uh, we've grown to 40 lawyers. We have an average tenure of 15 years, a minimum of eight. Uh, part of what keeps our costs down, I'll come to in a second, is that the big firms train the lawyers for us. Um, we started with two small local clients. We now have a national presence with uh, 110 clients uh, through the end of September. Uh, full service emphasis on transactional work is what we do. This is an interesting slide. This, this really is the core for us and it's the core uh, of the value proposition for <coughs> most of the virtual and new model firms. Uh, we'll take a lawyer who used to bill out at $600 an hour uh, in the big firm environment. Uh, and we have an example, Louisa Carroll, but it's true for any of the lawyers here. Uh, and then we'll remove bits of overhead and uh, if, uh, allow the, the uh, rate to the client to be half, $300 an hour in this case. Um, and so by, by operating in this lower overhead environment, we're able to uh, charge half the rate. I mean, our, our pitch to the marketplace is find legal minds at half the rate. Um, and so we take out the space, we take out reduced partner leverage and sort of in a sense, it's profit to the partners. So some amount of when associate bills goes to the uh, partner uh, as profit. We get rid of the summer program, unfortunately. Uh, we have no junior associates to train. Slightly lower pay for the lawyers. We pay $125 an hour um, at, as an eighth year associate a big firm might make a little bit more than that. Uh, about the same, but with benefits. We don't always pay benefits to get to 300. So that's. That's in a nutshell. It's been a good time to compete with the big firms because uh, they can't come down from 600. Um, they've made these long-term decisions. They've locked them into a high cost base, so they might be able to hold fees flat or maybe even give a slight discount, but they can't come down 50 percent. Whereas we're giving uh, clients big firm lawyers for for half the rate. Uh, how does this? Uh, what, what kind of lawyers do we see? Uh, this is where you get some of the entrepreneurial. Uh, lawyers who join. I mean, in a sense, the place is very entrepreneurial for us, and it's also true of the new model firms generally, in that we're disruptors. Uh, it's, it's, we're upstarts in the industry. We're taking, it's, it's a good time to be out. We're, we're growing and developing, and we're implementing new ideas all the time. And so we get a lot of people who want to come over. There's, they kind of break the mold. They want to come uh, practice here. And I'll give a couple examples after this quickly. Uh, people who enjoy practicing law, but not in a big firm environment, which is quite a number. Um, people want more balance in their lives, and then uh, also a little less interesting profile for present purposes, but semi-retired uh, lawyers. Lawyers who uh, don't want to bill 2,200 hours a year anymore, but they've got, they're too young to retire and they have great legal skills. Um, a couple quick examples of entrepreneurial lawyers at the firm. Uh, this is Bill McGrath. He joined us. Um, just within the last uh, six weeks or so. He was a partner at Wiley Ryan, uh, where he was billing at $685 an hour in DC. Um, he felt that he could do better at a lower rate. Um, the, 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 at the big firms, you get stuck with, a, in a sense, a, a firm rate. There's a little bit of latitude to depart from it, but uh, not much. Uh, he, he is bringing over, his, he's already brought over uh, most of his clients that he had at Wiley Ryan. But, uh, and now has the opportunity to go out and develop business at 45 an hour, which you wouldn't have there. Uh, also, we're open to all sorts of creative fee arrangements, fixed fees, contingent fees, uh, success, mixed success-based fees, and so forth. Um, and he can work from home and uh, in, a, in a friendlier environment. So okay. he's done well six weeks in. Um, before, before you move on to Harry, I just wanted to add that um, Bill really represents a pioneer in this new model world for us because as Ben said at the genesis of the firm, we really started off with these attorneys who had left big law mostly for family considerations. Um, but as the model and the firm has grown, what we've seen is that it really has attracted um, attorneys who are at all stages of their career. So not only in the you know, senior associate ranks, but now <coughs> we're seeing Bill, for example, he spent 22 years in big law. He achieved partnership at Wiley Ryan, and now 
he thinks, well, I'd really like to get away from the pressure of minimum, even partners have a certain minimum hourly requirements that they have annually. Um, they are restricted in the way that they can develop business because they have to keep a certain price point and they can't give discounts. Um, and so we're seeing partners such as Bill and then now Harry, as Ben will describe, uh, start to move their practices wholesale straight from big law um, to a new model environment. Could, could you clarify, Ben, on the prior slide, what is um, uh, on the prior? Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> we'll get it Go ahead while you're. Uh, I was just curious. Uh, press, I think you might have pressed B. Press B again. Yeah, did you press B? No, he pressed something on the. I pushed this button. Uh, there. there we go. There we go. Okay. If you go back. Uh, Thanks, Nathan. <laughs> it wasn't clear to me how much of the 485 does Bill keep? 75%. Yeah. So, yeah. And what's Bill's relationship to the firm? Is he an independent contractor? Uh, he is an independent contractor. So that's why you don't pay benefits. Yeah. Not yet. So we're still young. We're still a young firm, um, and we're only two and a half years old. Um, but we do anticipate that we will eventually um, get to that type of regime. But so, in what respect are you the firm? In other words, right. if, if the lawyers are independent contractors. Well, it's it's more like a collection of counsel. Well, right. Counsel are often the so is it a sole loan proprietorship? Uh, no, there, we have some partners uh, okay. in, in the mix. Uh, but I would uh, say the the difference between the, the, in that first uh, when I had the lay of the land, the landscape, mm -hmm. the difference between the law, true law firms and the high end legal staffing and so forth is that the attorney client relationship runs between the client and the firm and the lawyers within the firm at a true firm. Whereas in the high legal staffing arrangements and the other ones, the attorney client relationship is facilitated between the client and the lawyer, but the firm isn't part of it. So, so do you clear conflicts through the firm, or yes. do the individual lawyers clear conflicts? We, we function much as the traditional firm, except we're in a low overhead environment. So they're working from home offices, client sites, flexible space. But it just as Bill would when he was at Wiley Ryan, if he needed associate support, or if he had a client with a need outside of his expertise, he refers it to <coughs> another attorney at the firm. Um, so we have attorneys working collaborative as well. They're not just independent in that sense. And, and I would say, I wouldn't even use the word refer, I would say he, he sends it, draws yeah. into the team another member of the firm to help. On how, the does, how does billing work then? How, how does credit for that work then? So, uh, I mean, it's complicated, but... Uh, I, it's, I, I mean, these are the questions. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, it is, we, we've come up with a system that, that attempts to emulate or mirror the type of partner point system you would get at a big firm. So you get points for origination, you get credit for, uh, more credit for originating work and doing it yourself, you get some credit for originating work and handing to other people, and then you get credit for working on work that other lawyers bring in. There's a formula. There is a formula, formula. and yeah. actually I think how we've improved upon the big law formula is big law, it depends, differs from firm to firm, but basically what we've heard but anecdotally is that partners at the end of the room, you have the end of the year go into some smoky room and afterwards they come out as a complete black box and there's not really, there's some points given for generating business, some for doing marketing for the firm, but it's not really known exactly what your number is. Here when you join the firm, we clearly set out you get a certain percentage high for work that you originate and service yourself, another percentage for work you originate and another attorney at the firm works on, and then another amount for work that you perform that's done but the firm brought the client in. I would say there, within big law there are two types. There's the closed systems and the open systems. So closed is black box, you know what's going on. But even in the open systems, there's a lot of log rolling at the end of the year. I'll give you credit for this, but you have to agree to give me credit for what I did over here. And there's 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 still quite a bit of give in the joints. You don't we don't that. do that. It's all very clear from the formulas. And, and, but you're the adjudicator of the formula. That is, a, if there, it's there's, a no gray area, they join there's no the gray area. It's, it's not there's no gray area. So it's, it's a, totally a formula. It's, it's, it's not based on earnings. It's based on revenue. So it's okay. top line. So you don't have to worry about how things are allocated. There's none of that. It's okay. just all very straightforward. And I'm sure there's going to be a ton of questions. So yeah. Do yeah. You We're at the very end. Yeah. Go ahead, and, and we should let you yeah. take okay. some questions too. Uh, we have two slides left. Uh, Harry came over as a partner at um, uh, Patent Boggs in DC. Uh, he, he had an idea, he's a healthcare attorney, he had an idea about, uh, it seemed to me novel, um, it, that, that he'd been trying to get this firm to, um, to pursue, which was to go to healthcare clients with 
uh, software that would review millions of claims uh, looking backwards in time and flag for the, the hospital chains, let's say, uh, potential problem areas that then Harry would interpret and advise the client on uh, their exposure uh, and how to improve things going forward. It's the same type of software that the government itself uses in reviewing uh, Medi Medicaid and Medicare type claims. Um, but the firm, it, it, the margins were viewed as too low. Uh, it was also viewed as a kind of distraction from the main bill by the hour approach. And so uh, he couldn't get any traction uh, at his big firm. And so not only are we encouraging that here, but we're helping fund it. Uh, and, uh, so far, so good. We'll see how that goes. Uh, and the third type of entrepreneurial attorney, uh, Jeff Mason, came to us from Finnegan Henderson, which is one of the very big patent uh, boutiques out there. Uh, he was there for eight or nine years doing big pharma litigation. Uh, in the course of that litigation, he developed an idea about how to, from a technology standpoint, how to aid big law firms in running big patent cases. And he developed a proprietary piece of software He's uh, been busy building it, um, not through us, uh, but what we allow him to work uh, a flexible schedule with us. He works part-time, probably 20 hours a week on average, um, uh, practicing patent law, and then he also, uh, on, for, that helps him support himself while he's building his business. So it's just another angle of entrepreneurship. Uh, and lastly, the requisite slide, we've, uh, <laughs> hockey stick, we've grown quite a bit in the, since we've launched. Uh, that's the number of clients we've had in total. Uh, we had its spike up even further in the fourth quarter of 13 with the addition of Bill McGrath. He brought a dozen clients with him, and we've also continued to sign more. And some of the bigger ones that we've signed are at the bottom. Uh, so, questions? Anybody? I have a question. Being a product of big law and having practiced for 23 years, you talk about low overhead, low cost. But one of the beauties about big law is that we support our partners when in different groups when times are slow. If we're a large firm and we have bankruptcy and it's booming and they're doing well, they can support other crops that we're growing with the firm. In your model, do you support your peers when they're slow? So the answer is no. Um, and we push the risk of uh, workflow to the lawyers. They're absorbing it. And that's why we don't have junior lawyers, by the way. We're bringing in lawyers who are financially secure. They're either they're uh, semi-retired or they're, um, they've, they've uh, they're married to a, a law firm partner who's making millions or what have you. Um, uh, or, or they're confident in the, in the business that they already have, and so they can absorb the ebbs and flows of business. But I would question the initial premise that you yeah. mentioned. I think these days that uh, law firms are not, it's not that like it was, of course. I mean, the year as good as your last six months of yeah. billings. And, and even while, this quote right here, while Gottschall, this was from June. This is just a couple of months ago. Uh, as the firm, Weil, one of the top firms in the country, laying off 60 associates, uh, de uh, chopping the comp of 30 partners, 30 equity partners, and laying off 110 staff. It's a uh, tough world. Tough world. So uh, we don't, but that, that's just how it's, law, law is becoming more like a business. But could you, know. you talk a little bit about the risks? So you don't provide health care, you don't provide certain overhead. So what are the risks being associated with your firm? Well, let me. Uh, we do occasionally provide health care. I should say, we, if a lawyer is important enough doing a lot, enough work with us, we will pay for their health care on the side. We're just not doing it as a, as, through the firm as a, a large program, although we continue to revisit that as we've gotten as, bigger. As we grow, these are things that we'll continue to look at and probably adopt over time, but we're still in you know, startup mode. The, 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 it's the financial risk, mostly. Um, we will never have a layoff because we're only paying when the lawyers are working. Right. You don't have uh, to pay the law. Well, there, there, no, there are no minimum billable requirements. It's a, it's a very happy environment if you're confident in what you're doing and you feel you can develop business and you're happy, or maybe you don't feel you can develop business, but you're happy just working on whatever comes in. And as we get bigger and bigger and there's more cross-fertilization taking place, it's, it's, it's gone well so far. Our attrition rate has been very low. I think we've lost two attorneys uh, in two and a half years that we've been in business. So. You've added how many? Sure. We're up to 40, 43 uh, from 10. So. Yeah. I'd like to know the composition of your portfolio of clients. Oh, I should have put a slide in the appendix on that. So it's, um, we have 100, let's use the 110 clients that I had up there. Uh, we have a dozen big <coughs> company slash institutional clients, uh, big schools, let's say. Uh, and then we have the, the bulk of the remaining clients are private companies, uh, either startup through you know, $100 million revenue in that range. 
Uh, we have a handful of individuals, trust and states work. Um, but that's on a number of client bases. If you look at it from a, a revenue basis, it's uh, substantially big public companies. Uh, that's more than half of the revenue. Uh, because for them, it's the value proposition holds truer than any other spot. That hey, for every for every hour that they send us, instead of paying six hundred, they're paying three hundred. They feel like they're not spending three hundred. They feel like they're saving three hundred. And so, uh, it's once once we get in there and do a nice bit of work for them, it's easy for them to turn on the spigot and just send us more work. In the case of the smaller companies, it's different. It's that they they previously wouldn't have had access to high end legal talent. They would go under lawyers. They wouldn't do IP protection. They wouldn't. Work. Contracts will sort out later, we're building the business, and then once we make it big, we'll square it all away. Now we've allowed them to tap into the high-end legal talent earlier in their life cycle. Yeah, any other? Let's see it, Brian. Does, does your business model sort of rest <coughs> on the assumption that big law is never going to change? It can't change? Well, for the foreseeable future, I mean, the, the uh, we're becoming more like a big law firm, actually, I would say, just that, uh, and there will be convergence one day, I think. Um, and by coming back to what Guha mentioned at the beginning, there's a, the role, obviously, for big firms. They'll always be there on the big corporate deals and big better company litigation and that kind of thing. But so much of the work is just a half step below that, uh, run the company kind of work, uh, that, that, uh, that where we can, we can more effectively do that. I think that part of the problem with the big firms, I think one day it will change. It will take a generation. But uh, part of the problem is mindset. Uh, this is how they've grown up. This is the whole way that they practice. The firms are run by 65-year-old men. Uh, nothing wrong with that. But it's just that they, they don't have the same perspective on technology. And, and so um, I think it'll be, I don't know what it'll look like in 30 years, but it's going to be a long time before the big firms adjust. Yes. Yeah. Yes, um, do you think as you get bigger, you'll start um, having more junior attorneys that are working because it does seem like yeah. you're going to be somewhat limited in terms of the types of matters that you can work on. No, you're exactly right. Um, we're, we're looking at that right now. Um, early on, uh, we were reluctant to take on fixed costs. Uh, the junior lawyers, we have to pay a salary, uh, really. They're not in a position so much to bear the ups and downs of business, but um, we're starting to get enough a predictable workflow that I think we could justify a couple slots. Um, so that'll be something we look at. And when we do that, we'll be moving more into a W-2 environment where we plan benefits. And it's a big, we spend all day putting out fires, and it's, it's, uh, it's a luxury sometimes to take a step back, and, and which luxury we don't often have, think about direction of the firm and, and this kind of thing. But that is, we, we get asked that a lot, and we, we're starting to get interest uh, from clients on that. I mean, one other thing on it is we're building at 300, 350 an hour. That's what a client may pay for a junior lawyer. We're going to pay more than that. At, at a big firm, and so we're not getting a lot of uh, interest, or, or uh, clients are not vocal about wanting junior people. But the truth is, we could optimize more than we are, I and mean, we have senior people doing this work, and the clients don't mind paying. We could bring a junior person, charge two hundred an hour, pay them less. Yeah, yeah. That's sweet. So if your uh, lawyers work from home, do you, do you care what states they work in? And how does that? that work? That's a big or, issue. Or yeah, that's issues? that's a big issue. Um, we're running into that more and more, and uh, when we started, it was, well, let's just see what happens, and now as we've gotten bigger, we've had to grapple with that kind of thing. Um, Multi-jurisdictional practice, in general, all the big firms are struggling with it in some sense. The rules are outdated, the ethics rules, they change slowly. They're all state by state, it's the state level kind of thing, the bar rules. And so you'll see advisory opinions from bar committees that will start to slowly reverse some of the earlier decisions that were out there. But so far, we managed it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you don't, you know, back when I was, I was a company in Berlin in, back in the mid-90s, and there, from the safety of, and comfort of my own office in D.C., I would advise clients all over the country, and it was no big deal. Um, you, of course, litigation is different, or uh, dispositions of real estate is another area where you really have to be barred. But if you're just giving advice from, a, from afar, it's usually not an issue. We do get into issues where we will provide support to a, a client, uh, and maybe they want the lawyer to come in a lot uh, to work. Maybe they work with the business people on a series of deals, uh, not big corporate deals, but you know, uh, client, client agreements, that kind of thing. Then that kind of starts to play a role. And then the, like in Virginia, which is just outside where we are, there are rules about, well, you can do that as long as uh, the work is either temporary or uh, occasional. And so then there are definitions about what temporary and occasional. But it is a big deal, and we're, we, have, we have to deal with it every day. 
Yes. So as a law student who, um, it, it sounds to me like this is sort of an attractive uh, okay. round. Um, what, what you're looking for, I look at ClearSpire and WorkSite as well, and they require a five-year minimum. But yeah. so really the model you're looking for is to go spend five, seven years in new law, yeah. and then jump on your, your partner level over to your firm. Is that sort of? That's how it's been. I, I think that, uh, I mean, part of what keeps our costs down is we're not doing the training yeah. for the lawyers. So, yeah. well, that, that comes back to that earlier question. At some point, that's going to break down. If the big firms stop doing it also, yeah. uh, then right. the lawyers going to get trained. But that's a long way off. Um, right now, that's that's the projection here. Yeah. Maybe law school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. Um, I was wondering what your, like, recruitment uh, processing strategy is for the lawyers that you that end up joining you, and also yeah. what reaction, if any, do you get from big law? I mean, is it kind of, uh, is it That's a good question. So the, uh, it's been a buyer's market for legal talent uh, in, in D.C., any big city, really. But uh, I think in D.C., 80,000 lawyers. There are 80,000 lawyers in D.C., and a lot of them are highly educated and gone to top schools and worked at top firms. And a lot of, uh, there's a lot of disaffected lawyers uh, were looking for an alternative. And so we haven't even really advertised. We get, we get a dozen resumes a week, probably, just online. Uh, friends of friends, or people call, or they say, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. And we even had a Supreme Court clerk, uh, to a Supreme Court clerk supply um, in the last couple months. It's been, I mean, incredible. We're a two-year-old firm that nobody knows. Um, and so it's been word of mouth. Uh, we, we haven't, you know, the client side is harder to solve. The attorney side has been pretty straightforward. But how do you pick up them? That is, what are you looking for? What's your criteria of picking people? Well, we're looking for people that our clients will want to work with. Um, so often GCs still who are our primary audience, are, are uh, they're old school. They want to see Harvard Law, Yale Law, they want to see a nice clerkship, they want to see a nice round at Skadden, and, um, and, then the, and also focus on a practice area. They don't want, they, nobody wants talented generalists anymore. You know, they want to see FCPA 10 years in London and the US, learning the two major statutes, and then they're happy to get us involved because they know this person, if they're, especially if it's an initial project, they know this person can't go wrong. Uh, so we look for that. We, you know, jumping around from firm to firm to firm or different in-house environments, that's a harder profile to sell to, to a client. Um, you know, once we're in with a client, we can, they're not looking so much at who we put on whatever matters come up. But as a lot of our work is getting that initial matter. And so they're, we try to find lawyers who have this, they're, they're subject matter experts. And they're, well, they're pedigreed. That's what, that's what we look for. Yeah. What have you personally found are the attributes that make lawyers good at, at serving clients? Uh, well, there are a couple. I mean, the one, responsiveness is big. And it's amazing that people don't know that. But you know, when a client sends you something, you don't wait a couple days to respond. Even if you can't get to it for a couple days, if you say right away, you know, hey, I'm happy to help. Uh, I won't be able to look at this for two days. If, you know, if that's all right, I can get to it. Otherwise, if you need something right away, let me talk to somebody else at the firm. You know, uh, that's a basic thing. Another is um, uh, like CEO or C-level communication. Uh, so just one thing is in, you, in law school, especially you, you learn so much and you get to the weeds, uh, learning of different cases and so forth. And sometimes it's hard to roll that up and to distill it down to just a kind of 30 second summary that you can give to the client and then tell, tell them what they should do or should not do. And then uh, quickly go through the basis for it or but allow them to ask you questions about, you know, why do you say that, why do you say that? Often lawyers tend to just tell the story from beginning to end. And if you're dealing with a busy GC or what have you, they don't want to hear that. They want to hear, just tell me what I need to know. Tell me the answer first. Leave with the answer. Um, and then, I don't know, I think just professionalism in a, in a way, not, it, it's amazing. Not being prickly, just get, getting along, being sympathetic with the clients listening. Of course, they have to be smart and know how to find the right answer. But at least the packaging makes a big difference. Yeah, that's what I would say. You just mentioned the last sentence. How do you handle legal research? Like Westlaw accounts and things like yeah. that? Yeah. Well, we have that. You have, and that's, yeah. So that's a firm wide thing. Yeah. It's firm wide. It's all cloud based. Um, accessed by attorneys from their home offices or wherever they happen to be working. Um, anywhere you can have access to the internet, you can have access to our legal research capabilities. You know, Westlaw, Practical Law Company, um, all of the research tools that you would get um, at a big law firm. But I take it no actual books, right? Which is not surprising. Yeah. 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 But it's amazing these days. I hadn't used legal research in a long time. Uh, and I was Lexus guy back in, in law school, and we have Westlaw now, and it's incredible. Well, you all probably use it, but it's 
It's, you don't. You can highlight things on the screen, and, yeah. and you can type notes on the side. You don't need to print it all and highlight it. And, you know, you can copy and paste. I mean, is there a physic? Is there an office? Yeah. Okay. We so we have. Uh, we're in the Reagan Building, thirteen hundred Penn mm -hmm. uh, in DC. So it's a beautiful location. It has the requisite marble and columns and all that. Mm -hmm. um, but we rarely go in. I mean, we we have client meetings there. We have uh, attorney interviews there. We have team sessions there. But vast majority of the work is done from home offices. And we actually just opened a second office in Stamford, Connecticut. Um, our partner who recently joined us, Amy Breslow, for the Trust and Estates practice, um, uses that office primarily to meet with clients and um, do that. So, so we now have a second office and are thinking of a West Coast expansion as well. Other questions? Yes. I have another question about what, how do you spend your time then? I mean, you know, are you a, are you like a producer manager? Do you do you also practice or is this a full-time yeah. job leaving this firm and oh, more well, or like, less management it's like, it's like 10 jobs um, <laughs> yeah. i've become an administrator basically yeah. um i would love to i should be spending 90 percent of my time out developing business and overseeing things and it's all that all day is things you know we have 40 40 lawyers and 110 clients the, the network effects i mean it's just there's always something coming up um and so uh i practice Probably ten hours a month. Mm -hmm. I build probably ten hours a month, uh, but mostly it's just building the business. Right. Yeah. Yes. Talk, talking about how most of your lawyers bring clients with them, they yeah. bring business with them, and you talking about going out and raising business and kind of acquiring some of those clients. How do you assign some of those lawyers to these new clients you acquire? So it, this has been new territory for us. So Bill McGrath is the biggest example of that the guy from Wiley Ryan. He's a dozen clients, including Radio Shack and uh, Tyco. Mm -hmm. um, so he's just joined, and the, the, uh, we're going through that right now. Um, he's the biggest example. We've had others come over. Mostly, uh, mostly they're doing the work themselves. The, 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 if it's a regulatory practice, often it's not heavy use of uh, lower level associates, and so they, the clients come with them because of what they know. They're subject matter expert. So, um, but they do have needs, and we. They don't know the lawyers at the firm we do uh, when they first come over, so we just it's just a discussion, and uh, they can get comfortable introduce them to a handful of <coughs> lawyers who could do the work, and they can decide who they want to work with. I think we have time for one more question. Do they oh, do, we, uh, do they do their own malpractice insurance? We have that as a firm. You do it. Firm so so how do you do? You have a intake process that is if people want to bring in clients, so they have to clear them through you. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So. It's part of the conflicts check. It's right. Part, it's it's first we have to decide that we as a firm want to take on a client. Yeah. Um, there may be uh, just uh, maybe certain clients we don't want to serve, um, uh, or maybe it's inconsistent with the, the what we're trying to carve out the the, the brand of the firm. Um, we're not going to you know personal injury. Of course, we're not going to take that. But other things, uh, uh, you know. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi or something. I don't know if we would do that. Uh, you, you know, I mean, like there are judgment calls on that. Um, yeah, and, and it's a central that, intake system. Central intake. Yeah. 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 We're just we're indistinguishable from a big traditional law firm, except on the cost side. Uh, and part of that is only paying lawyers for the time when they're working, and the fact that we don't have a lot of office space. Um, but the same systems: timing, time uh, invoicing. We bill monthly. Uh, we pay payroll monthly to the lawyers. Um, we have the, the legal research that you would be expected to have at your desktop if you're sitting in your big uh, office downtown, but now it's your office upstairs. Do you require exclusivity? Among your Most of the time, we have a couple exceptions uh, where we'll, we'll allow, let's say it's patent, uh, patent prosecution, um, the chemical arts kind of thing, where we're, no way we're gonna have enough work to keep, to hold the lawyer's attention who has a background in that. But if they're a solo practitioner, they have practice and they have some excess capacity, we can we can bring it in and make it available to clients. And so in that case, we won't require exclusivity. They have their own practice. Uh, we don't do that often, but for a couple specialized areas, we do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, wait, another question. Um, you mentioned that you encourage your, uh, you know, the entrepreneurial interest and um, pursuits of, you know, you like to think Ken Perry. Like yeah, Harry Silver. And I'm just wondering, like, if, um, you know, do you allocate budget for that, or how do you how do you encourage them in that? In that yeah. Well, we, we're uh, for that particular project uh, involves software. He went out and found a, a vendor that has the software, and so we're paying. Oh, there's a licensing fee for the software. 
we're paying to, Harry's a brilliant lawyer. Um, he's not necessarily gifted at presenting a concept to a high level audience. And so we're, we have people involved in helping him, um, helping his presentation, his pitch sing. Um, and so we're invested in that um, and invested in brochures and that kind of thing. Um, that's how we have invested. Yeah. So maybe just to add onto that, um, do you see your uh, mission as trying to change the the way the law is practiced? So in other words, I get the cost structure idea, um, and I get the that that you're, because you can get people where you don't actually have to train them and, you know, again, all these models are parasitic on the big law firms training and training well. That's the way they're all working at the moment. But some of your competitors are trying to say, we, we practice law in a different way. We use, either we leverage technology in a way that isn't being done or that we bring multidisciplinary expertise yeah, in yeah. you're a little bit that we're we're yeah. doing so I wonder whether is that part of the way in which you're thinking about it or because or is it more we're just a better model of the existing framework by cutting out some of the excess waste in the cost. It's mostly an efficiency play. Yeah. Yeah technology we make better use of it than than the big firms. But I, even the new model, other new model firms, they, I think they, they attach, it's a good sales point to make. Mm -hmm. um, it's sexier uh, than, than what you just said, you know, it's a lower cost structure. Yeah. But uh, that, that's really a lower, lower cost structure. There's one other point though that's different, that's apart from the cost structure is, another way to look at what we've done is, we've made uh, pockets of high-end legal capacity accessible to the market that weren't previously accessible. To lower, in other words, small and medium-sized clients. Not just that, but take, take, take the stay-at-home mom or dad, okay. who was off the market oh, altogether. Well, now they have a, vent, they have a way to come back into the market. Mm -hmm. That's more efficient. Mm -hmm. And so there's that angle to it, too. There's the, the solo practitioner who's got excess capacity. These are just a small number, but we're also now allowing clients to, to uh, tap into that expertise as well. Um, and so there's, it's a combination of things. And maybe, I, there was one more thing you said to me before the session that's yeah. also responsive. Maybe you could offer that point and then we can stop. That was what you said before, what struck me was the uh, law firm memo to client or literary prose versus the McKinsey yeah, stuff. Yeah. I mean, that was just very striking to me and maybe yeah. quite appealing to our students as well. We're not all the way there yet, uh, but in my own background, I was at Covington, I went to McKinsey, I left law together at McKinsey for five years. And I was saying, That's why you're so good at that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things I noticed, I, it was a rough transition because I come from Covington, where everything, you know, we get 99% sure, or 99.5% sure of whatever we're doing. And I was a tax lawyer. So we would write these beautiful memos, and they'd be perfectly footnoted, and they'd take forever. And then I'd get thrown into the McKinsey culture, and, you know, I had three week mini MBA they gave me, but then it was just, they won't let you get 99% sure. You could get to 80% sure. Um, and then you can't write these beautiful memos. You have to just do PowerPoint and cut to the chase. Um, and that took some real adjustment, but now we use it all the time. Marlene and I, when we're um, performing legal work, uh, when we share findings with clients, it's like this. We don't, we don't write long memos. And I think that's more efficient. It's also hard. Uh, it takes a lot of time. But uh, I think it's a much more effective way to deliver. Yeah, well, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, Ben and Marlene, thank you all. Thank you both for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.